the first two-thirds of Book 5 of The Republic, especially focusing on the theme of human nature. Now, uh, we're going to look at the end of Book 5 and the first two-thirds of Book 6, and we're really going to be continuing with that theme of human nature, uh, but especially a part of it that, that came up. So last time, I emphasized that the distinctively important part about the human being for the political analyses they were giving was that part of us that uh, in book four was called the logisticon, uh, the calculating part, the thing that does logismos, calculation. And, you know, I, uh, I said we were going to have to reevaluate that a bit, and that's what we're going to do now. We're going to look more directly at what goes on in that dimension of ourselves, the part that calculates and figures things out. Uh, well, the real development of that part of ourselves is the development of our ability to grasp and comprehend the nature of our world, to understand. And that's really the development of philosophy. So as we now turn to the end of book five and then book six, we're really going to be looking at uh, philosophy uh, and the nature of the philosopher. Uh, and the end of book five is int uh, introduces that theme. Uh, as Socrates says, well, we've dealt with two waves but now we're going to deal with the third wave. And here's what he says the third wave is. This is at 473D. Unless political power and philosophy coincide in the same place, while the many natures now making their way to either, apart from the other, are by necessity excluded, there is no rest from ills for the cities, nor, I think, for humankind. Uh, and the shorthand for that is uh, philosophers rule as kings, or those now called kings and chiefs, genuinely and adequately philosophize. Uh, so we're going to go on to look at that, to look at who the philosopher is. Uh, but first, I want to begin by uh, revisiting the theme of the city that we've been discussing so far and think about how this notion here, this third wave, uh, relates to the sort of concept of the city as we've been so far developing it. So, Socrates has said that uh, until political power and philosophy coincide in the same place, the, you know, good city is not going to be properly realized. Well, I want to think about that point in relationship to the two main places we've earlier seen the story of the city being developed. The first one is back in Book 2, from 369b to 372a, when Socrates first generated the city out of this principle that the city, as I believe, comes into being because none of us is self-sufficient and we are in need of many, so we have to share our work and so on. And then his discussion in Book 4 of Justice in the City, that's from 432D to 433B. So let's go back and revisit some of the core points there and see how they relate to this claim about the so-called third wave. Uh, so, first of all, you remember that in Book 2, that, as I've been emphasizing, Socrates' distinctive approach was to understand the city from out of its possibility. Right? So, unlike those people he referred to in Book 5, those idle men who make themselves idler by talking about things without investigating their possibility, Socrates' approach to talking about the city is to ask, really, what is a city? What, what's a city about? Where does it come from? Why does it come into being? And that's what he begins with, right? The city, as I believe, comes into being because none of us is self-sufficient and we're in need of much, and so we get together and share, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, he said there that, well, you know, what you have to do is have people each do their work and... Um, uh, put the wor their work at the disposition of all in common, where each person does that thing they're sort of naturally suited to, uh, and this is division of labor such that collectively we make a city that satisfies our human needs very effectively. And in fact, at that point, uh, at the end of that, he asked Adamantus if he could see justice there, and Adamantus said, well, it seems like justice might be somewhere in some need those men have for one another. Which, which turns out more or less to be right. Um, but anyway, but that's how the thing was introduced. 
So then when he gets to book four and talks about justice in the city, uh, I want to remind you of how he introduces that talk. So first of all, at 432D, he says, uh, he, he talks about recognizing what justice is. And he says, ego katidon, right? That's that verb that I've been talking about from the beginning, kathorao, uh, the verb that started the very first discussion of the Republic uh, in book one. Um, and he says in, in Bloom's translation, I caught sight of it, right? So that's that's the way you have to describe what it is to recognize where justice in. And uh, Glaucon says, oh, you are, you're an evangelist. Uh, Eu angeles, you bring good news. Um, anyway, uh, so Socrates goes on to describe what that catidon is like. And he says, uh, it's, it's like we we're people who were whole, already holding the thing we were looking for uh, but it escaped our notice that's at uh, 432 D and E and that verb escaping your notice is a uh, lanthano uh, and it seems to me that is the counterpart of the verb I'm emphasizing cathoral there are things that escape our notice but there but we can sometimes see what was escaping our notice in what was already happening and that structure is, you know, he draws it out even more because he said, in my opinion, uh, we've been saying and hearing it all along, right? All the time that we've been talking about the city, we have, a, we have at the same time already been talking about justice. But he says, we weren't learning from ourselves that we were in a way saying it. Right? So that's, that's what that Katharao is about, right? We, he's, he's saying you need to see what was already intrinsic to what you were saying, but that you weren't noticing. And so he says, so what, what is justice? And he says at 433a, it's just that rule we set down in the beginning for the founding of the city, right? Uh, that each one must practice one of the functions of the city, right? That's the practice of minding one's own business uh, to how to pertain that we've talked about a lot, right? And that, that was really summarized at the beginning of book five at uh, 453b right each one must mind his own business according to nature and so on so socrates is, is now saying that's what justice is and he says a further thing about this at 433b he says this provided the power by which all the other virtues came into being and also once having come into being it provides them with preservation as long as it's in the city i want you to notice just the correlation of these ideas with that notion of power again. So uh, think about those things that are said there in relationship to this remark that uh, philosophy and political power must coincide. So what is the principle of the city? The principle of the city is that the city exists for the sake of the satisfaction of human need. And it is that project of setting up something to satisfy human needs that accounts for the generation of communities based on a division of labor and so on that's what they're for that's why they exist that's what they come from but then that's also what justifies them that's that's why they're here so if you set up a city you're doing a good job of setting up a city if in the way you set it up human need is actually satisfied right so in identifying the principle of the city you're also identifying the standard to which cities are answerable right many different cities many different societies come into being but socrates point is like this this is what civilization this is what human society is about this is what it's for so when you're talking about the first principle of the city, you're not exactly talking about an actual city. You're talking about what it is to be a city. The city as such, the city qua city, is this human project of getting together and working in common to satisfy human need. But so if that's what a city is, well, then you have various actual cities and you can say, how are they doing that and how well are they doing that? And cities will be better and worse at being cities, at being the human civilization they're supposed to be, to the extent that they are uh, environments that satisfy human need. And so actual cities, 
make actual decisions about how they're going to be organized. Remember, we talked about that uh, last time when we were talking about uh, human decision making in the context of the polis. You know, and as Aristotle says, people have to get together to talk about what's just and what's unjust and what's expedient and what's inexpedient for the city, right? So a political community is one where people get together and make decisions about how they're going to live. And those decisions can be better or worse according to what? According to how well those decisions do reflect human needs. And so good decision making is going to be decision making that answers to that principle of what the city is really about. Right? Uh, a city is going to be well run to the extent that its decisions uh, about policy, its way of organizing itself, reflects an understanding that it's about human need and an understanding of what human need is. So it's when decision making is made in light of a correct grasp of the principle of the city, which is ultimately inseparable from the principle of the human, that the city will be a good city. But so what, what is the grasp of the nature of the city and the nature of the human? Well, that's what philosophy is. Philosophy is the understanding of those first principles. So when Socrates says that philosophy and political power uh, have to coincide for the city to be just, that's not really different from saying that justice is that principle, that the city needs to be organized so that people in doing their things answer to the needs of each other and the human good is accomplished, right? In other words, the naming of the principle that the city comes from and the naming of the, the sort of goal or the norm by which it's fulfilled and saying that good city governance is the realization of that justice by grasping that principle, right? Th th those things are all just ways of basically saying the same thing. So th this thing Socrates calls the third wave um, uh, is really just the articulation, it seems to me, of what was already implicit in the things that were already said. And so once again, recognizing this is really a matter of kathorao. It's a matter of seeing and understanding the kind of um, sense already intrinsic to what you were involved with, though maybe it had escaped your notice. Maybe you hadn't uh, learned from yourself yet, learned from what was already happening in your experience yet, what this relevant point was. You can still take the form of a realization, but it's a realization of something that was already there for you to recognize. Um, anyway, that's the first point I want to make. Uh, but now let's talk a little bit more about a few of the structures of that, the implications of that point. Uh, when, when we say that Socrates identified the principle of the city, right, he, he identified, you know, its possibility, that, that, uh, that which is the source from which, you know, actual cities come into being, right, what, what it is that these things are about, what, what they're coming from, right. Uh, but so to call that the possibility, as we have been doing, is fine. But notice that we could just as easily call it the actuality. We could just as easily say, this is what it really is to be a city. Right? What a city is, is this uh, realization of a collective human effort to f fulfill human need. Right? So, uh, so the, that's what the city qua city is. So you could say this city is these people living here and doing this and it started on this date and ended on this date. Those things are all true. But what makes it a city, its, it's cityness, so to speak, is the fact that it is this collective organization of people for the sake of fulfilling human need. Right? So the city qua city, using that notion of qua, or the possibility or the potentiality that is a city, First of all, those two notions are the same, right? You can see that talking about the qua and talking about the possible are really just two roots into talking about the same kind of reality. Those things are the same as saying this is what a city actually is, the city qua city, the city qua city, 
or the city uh, as such. Uh, and the language that you see in Plato is this, the city kathoto, the city according to itself, uh, the city itself, uh, autotopolis. Um, so we're, when you're talking about the city as such, you're talking about the actuality of what it is to be a city. But then that also should lead us to notice that actuality is a word that can be said in different ways, right? That's the, giving you this first sense of actuality, like what it really is for the city to be a city. But, uh, you know, there are lots of actual cities, right? This city of that I live in of Toronto or the city that Socrates lives in of uh, Athens, you know, or, and there's Athens in 400 BC and there's Athens in, you know, 900 BC, right? There, there are lots of different historical realities, historical actualities, actual cities, actual forms city life is taking. And so, you know, we, we're right to call those actual cities too, but notice that that's a slightly different sense of actuality compared to the notion of what it is for the city to be a city. Right? So those, those, um, those actual cities are the ways myriad ways that the actuality of what it is for a city to be a city is enacted they're the ways that reality cityhood uh, has taken an existent form so but but you know every one of them is a is an attempt to realize that it's a way of enacting it but you know we would precisely uh, as i was saying earlier we would precisely judge the different realizations or enactments of the city by how well they measure up to the standards set by what it is for a city to be a city right so the the actuality the city as such is its defining principle but therefore also its sort of defining norm and particular cities we're going to say well how good a job are you doing of living up to what you're really about right? and so when when you uh look at actual cities and, and even recognize them as a city you're actually doing two things at the same time right you're you're both in seeing this as a city you're both seeing the sort of specific historical reality that this is as a process of actual existing in time and space right you're recognizing that, but you're also recognizing in, in light of the very meaning of what it is to be a city, uh, which is what warrants you to call it a city in the first place. Right? So whether or not you've learned from yourself or noticed about yourself that you're doing this, you are, in fact, grappling with two different kinds of recognition particular kind of recognition of the actuality that is the defining possibility or principle of the city as such and the recognition of the actuality that is the uh, historical process uh, of things around you so it may have escaped your notice that you were relying on that essential notion of what it is for a city to be a city but the very fact that you recognize this as a city means you've been in some way relying on that. And so Socrates' philosophical work is to, you know, take the city nowadays that he lives in. Like, he lives in a city nowadays just like Glaucon does. He doesn't go somewhere else uh, to figure out what a city is. But in encountering the same thing Glaucon is, he's making explicit what this reality is right what the what the principle is of which this is a realization or an enactment but you know also the principle of which other cities are an enactment and so on and so there are many different enactments of the meaning of the city and we will judge them in terms of how well or poorly they measure up to the norm of the city as such right uh, so we could call these different enactments of it, or we could call them different imitations of it, different ways uh, that meaning of the city as such is being uh, attempted, being enacted in this thing. So we could call them uh, uh, mimesis, right? Im imitations, uh, language we've, we've seen before. Um, so 
Socrates then is saying we, we are recognizing both what it is to be a city, the actuality that remains, that stays the same throughout all of this, uh, and this other kind of uh, reality that is the actuality of historical processes that kind of enact or imitate that, right? And so all of these things are in a sense the kind of moving images of those, that structure of actuality that is unchanging, right? What stays the same. Um, uh, so, uh, and that recognition by Socrates is a is that kind of kathorao, right? That that reality is something that is seen through, or I should say, that actuality is something that is seen through this actuality. The actuality, in the first sense of what it is for the thing to be, the thing that it is, is seen through the actuality that is the ongoing process of this thing's existence, and that structure is a structure that is true of basically any kind of living thing. If you talk about a tree or a dog, there, you know, you again recognize the same tree today and yesterday and last year or whatever, right? The same thing is being realized through all those changing stages of growth. The same dog that began as a puppy is being realized through all its processes of aging, action, whatever else, right? And so in recognizing it as this dog or as this tree you're both recognizing the unchanging actuality of what it is and the ever-changing actuality of its process and indeed when we say this dog we kind of capture that right the dog names the what of it and when we say this dog we're kind of saying you know this specific process right uh, so by looking at the things that we've already been saying about the city, we can see certain kinds of relationships that uh, are alive in our recognition of natural things all the time. Uh, and they particularly then fill out what's going on in this experience of kathorao, or what I was calling seeing through, or what Bloom translates as catching sight of. So with that in mind now, I want to turn back to the discussion at the end of Book 5 of the Republic. <laughs> So that ability to grasp these actualities in that first sense, right, these principles, the, to think in terms of the qua or possibility, that's a thing we can do. We've been doing it. Right? Uh, and that power, uh, which is really the power of kathorao, of seeing through actualities in that second sense to seeing what they are, that's the power of noose, or what's often translated as mind or intellect. And that recognition of those principles by our noose is what is always happening and allowing us to do things like recognize the dog as a dog or the tree as a tree or the city as a city. So whether or not uh, we've noticed it, we're doing it, right? It might have escaped our notice that we are doing that. But we are, and the proof of that is that we recognize these things. Uh, and so anyway, that, that reality of being able to grasp those core principles, to think in terms of the qua or possibility, that's what underlies our logismos, our ability to calculate and figure things out. And so we do that all the time, and that is the ongoing demonstration of this kind of deeper grasp we have of these basic principles. So the philosopher is the one who actually turns to those things, right? And, and takes up explicitly what those principles are, what those principles are that are already animating our grasp of our situation, right? Um, and just as we can ask that about the city, the tree, or the dog, Yes, what what is it to be a dog or a tree or a city? We can do that with the the whole world of what is actually happening. We can do that. We might say with reality as such. So from our engagement with actual things, the world of becoming, the world of things coming to being and passing away, we can ask, what is it to be? We can ask the question of being as being, being qua being, being as such, kathauto, 
right? The, we can ask about what it is that always remains self-same in and through all of these uh, actual existings. Right? And that's then the distinctive activity of the philosopher. Philosophers could investigate being qua being. What does that involve? Well, you know, the route we've already gone is that we've noticed about ourselves that we do make certain kinds of recognition. And so we've had to ask about ourselves, what, what are we such that that is possible for us? Right? And that's what our study of the soul has been about, the division of the soul, the study of Anthropos in Book 5. We've been investigating human nature in the sense of recognizing the defining characteristics of ourselves that uh, account for the experiences we actually have. And that has just now uh, drawn our attention to noose, right? That we are the kind of being who is characterized by the capacity to recognize things like the qua and the possible. Okay, well, just as we can do that with ourselves, we can do that with reality. We can say, well, what are the things we recognize in the realm of actualities? You know, in that second sense, the, the things that actually transpire in the time and space of our existence here and now. We can see what those things are, and, and in seeing what we recognize to characterize our world, we can then say, well, reality has to be such that these things are possible. What do we notice? Well, all along in, throughout the Republic, as in daily life, you know, we've been talking about beautiful things, good things, talking about justice. So we have to recognize that reality must be the kind of thing such that beautiful things and uh, just things and good things are a possibility. They can be. So our question is, what is reality like such that there are beauties and goods and just acts, just things? So we're then going to ask about Beauty as such, the good as such, beauty kathauto. Right? And that's what the philosopher is going to be doing, really, in uh, investigating being qua being. The philosopher is going to be trying to understand what is reality such that it makes these things possible, right? So with that in mind, I want to now turn to Book 5, uh, 475e to 476d. Uh, so Socrates uh, begins by, you know, he's just defining the philosopher. And he says, the philosophers are the lovers of the sight of the truth. And so they're going to explain what that is. And so Socrates says, okay, so fair, kalon, beautiful, is the opposite of ugly, right? Uh, and th they together are two, so each of them is one. And, he's, and he says, the same is true of justice and injustice, good and bad. Each is itself one. Uh, but... By showing up everywhere in a community with actions, bodies, and one another, each appears many. So then Socrates draws this distinction. He says, okay, on the one side, there are those who love sights, who love the arts, and people who are practical men. And on the other side, there are the ones we will rightly call philosophers. The lovers of hearing and the lovers of sights surely delight in fair sounds and colors, beautiful sounds and colors, uh, etc., etc., but wouldn't, on the other hand, those who are able to approach the beautiful itself, the fair itself, Auta to Kalon, and see it by itself, Horan Kathauto, be rare? I'm just making clear that the language here he's using is the same language we've just been using. And so then Sarki says, well, is the man who holds that there are fair things, but doesn't hold that there is beauty itself, uh, is he, in your opinion, living in a dream or is he awake? And then he says, uh, and what about the man who, contrary to this, believes that there is something fair itself and is able to catch sight of it, Kathoran, uh, to catch sight of it and what participates in it, and doesn't believe that what participates is it itself, nor that it itself is what participates. Right? Is, is he living in a dream or is he awake? Um, and, and wouldn't you say that uh, this man's thought is knowledge, whereas the other is opinion? Uh, uh, so my point is that that discussion there has pretty much said the same things we were already saying. Like he's describing, I think, uh, familiar structures of our experience. We recognize beautiful things. 
And so we have to be able to say, well, what is beauty as such? And what is reality such that beauties are possible? What is reality such that goods are possible? What is reality such that just acts or unjust acts are possible? Um, and that's what the philosopher does through kathorao, through seeing through the actualities in the second sense that we encounter, the things coming to being and passing away that we say are good, good ones, beautiful ones, to grasp what it is by virtue of which they are beautiful and good, which is to say what it is by virtue of which we are able to recognize them as beautiful and good. Uh, and then I want to make one more point. Uh, you know, right near the uh, end of Book 5, at 479a, he says, um, of the many fair things, that, you know, beautiful things, is there any that won't also look ugly? And of the just things, any that won't look unjust? Of the holy, that many that won't look unholy? Um, you know, uh, we were talking about these two different senses of actuality. You know, what beauty as such is, or what being as such is, or what the city as such is, versus the actual beautiful things, actual processes of existing, uh, actual cities. Right? Um, uh, and, you know, we, we were talking before when we were talking about the city, about the way that we judge, you know, how good a city this is or how bad a city it is by how it measures up to its defining principle. You define whether a dog is healthy or not by how it measures up to, you know, what it is as a dog. You define whether a tree is healthy or not by what it is as a tree, qua tree. Uh, um, so the existing forms, the comings into being and passings away of the actual, in the second sense, things that we encounter, uh, we understand and interpret in light of what their basic kind of reality is, what it is for them to be those things. And so, you know, with the dog, you know, no, no dog is the dog. No city is the city. There are dogs and cities which are ways of enacting what that thing is. And they will, you know, do a better and worse job of doing that. So especially in the city, you know, we are saying that the we're going to judge how good, how just a city is by how well its realization lives up to its defining principle. And so the answer is going to be, you know, in certain ways, any city that warrants the name, any city that can be called a city will, to some degree, be a human institution of fulfilling human need. But it could be a poor one. It could be very unjust or it could be very just. Right. But it's, it's always going to be in certain ways fulfilling our needs and in certain ways not. Right. And so uh, it's going to be a. Uh, good city in some ways, bad in others. And depending on what you notice about it, you, you will be able to notice how it's sort of succeeding or how it's failing. So with with any kind of existing thing, any sort of thing that exists as a living process of realizing some kind of identity, it's not going to be that identity. So it's going to both be a version of it, like it's, it's going to be it, it's going to be a way that, you know, beauty appears, but it's also going to be a way that beauty kind of fails to appear or that ugly appears. Like it's not going to be the perfect thing. So any, any thing that is a good is not going to be the good itself. It's going to be good in certain respects and in other respects, not a city is going to be, you know, a good city in some respects, but in other ways it's going to be failing to live up to what it's supposed to be. Um, so again, remember he said before, you know, these things are one, but they always appear and exist in community with bodies and actions and so on uh, and one another. Uh, uh, and th those bodies and actions as which these things are present here and now are, are always, you know, imperfect. And so they are, they are, but realizations both of the beautiful and of the ugly realizations both of good and not good and that point about the ambivalent reality of all the things we actually encounter uh is quite important right so and that's why seeing through is kind of an issue the beautiful thing doesn't just give you beauty 
You, you, you have to see beauty through it. And so somebody can, for example, play you a piece of music and you might fail to see why it's beautiful because all you might see in it is, I don't know, somebody made a mistake or it's not the style you like or whatever, right? Like the, the, that piece of music in its particular realization is a lot of things. And you might only see it in a certain way, not see the beauty in it. The, it, it because it's not the simple fact of beauty simpliciter, you might fail to notice what's there. And the same with things that are good, right? There isn't going to be a thing that's simply good. Anything that's going to be good, you know, could also be bad. And that's the point I want to pick up on now. Uh, and uh, in talking about the philosopher, and in particular, I want to turn to Socrates' discussion of the education of the philosopher. So at the beginning of Book 6, uh, Socrates uh, has defined the philosopher. So he says at 484b, philosophers are those who are able to grasp what is always the same in all respects, while those who are not able to do so but wander among what is many and varies in all ways are not philosophers. Right? Uh, that, that should just resonate with what we're talking about. Right? The philosopher is the one who is oriented towards uh, you know, being qua being, the, the character of reality such that the things we encounter have the character they have. So that's really just the definition, and that should be the same as what you're already expecting. And then he continues this discussion of the philosophers as guardians, and he says, uh, you know, if they're going to be guardians, wouldn't we want those uh, who not only know what each thing is, but also don't lack experience or fall short of the others in any other part of virtue? Uh, so basically what he's saying here is, you know, when we're talking about philosophers, especially in as much as we're talking about the, the, the people who fulfill that principle of that by which the city should be governed, you're going to talk about people who uh, have really fulfilled their human potential as a whole. Right? Uh, and so the, the discussion now of the philosopher, which is what really the first two-thirds at least of book six is about, quite explicitly, uh, is really about this person who is a kind of, you know, the comprehensive uh, fulfillment of human nature, right? And so, you know, what are you going to need? You're going to need to be courageous, you're going to need to be moderate, all those other things. Uh, and so it's in light of that, then, that I want to read you this thing from 491b. And they're talking about how the philosopher is going to be educated, and, and Socrates says, well, wouldn't um, what is most surprising of all to hear be that each one of the elements we praised in that nature, the person who's going to become a philosopher, has a part in destroying the soul that has them and tearing it away from philosophy. I mean, courage, moderation, and everything we went through. Uh, so, you know, he's saying you got to be courageous, you got to be moderate. Those are the things that are going to really make it possible for you to fulfill this highest thing. But those things could also be what destroy you. Why? Because they're all temptations to focus on something else. right? The, the courage, in other words, is an element in the fulfillment of the fully developed person. But courage can exist in other contexts too. Right? You can have someone who's a, you know, very courageous in doing bad deeds. Uh, so the, his point here is, there are things you can develop in yourself that are part of being good, but they could lead you astray. Like, you know, maybe you're really smart. That's a good thing. That can be a real part of being able to grasp things. But if you're really smart, well, that thing that could be good might also be what encourages you to become really arrogant and make you not such a good person. right? So is being smart a good thing or not? Well, there's no simple answer to that. Smart is ambivalent. Right? So it's good insofar as, but it's not good insofar as, right? So that's, you know, the point Socrates was making when he said, you know, the good as such always uh, appears in communion with bodies and actions and so on. But none of those things is simply good or bad, right? And here you're seeing that. Here you're seeing how there are realities that are good insofar as they're sort of turned in the right direction, seen and taken up in the right way. But that very thing that is good can also be bad. So I want to bring that out here, not so much for focusing on 
the education of the philosopher, which is in itself a pretty important and interesting topic, but really to try to bring out a little bit the sense of that idea that goods are not unambiguously goods, beauties are not unambiguously beauties, and so on. So part of the point of that is we can now see from Socrates' analysis why Adamantus's answer was wrong back in book two. Right? Remember, I, I noted this at the time, uh, way back at 379b, when they were talking about the nature of the good and the idea that that's what really needed to be properly reflected in our stories and so on. Uh, Socrates asked Adamantus whether uh, whether a good thing could actually be harmful. And Adamantus says, no, not in my opinion. Uh, well, Socrates' point here is very clearly yes. And Socrates asked whether, you know, the good could really be what's responsible for anything bad. And again, uh, Adamantus' answer was no, but, but on the contrary, we can see the answer is precisely yes, right? It's the very nature of uh, the good itself or beautiful itself or the city itself to be that which is explaining why those things exist that are uh, precisely ambiguously good, ambiguously beautiful, ambiguously cities. Anything that is, is going to be, you know, good and bad, beautiful and ugly in different ways. And that's what Adamantus really failed to recognize back in book two. Uh, and so you can see there's going to be a very big difference between Socrates' understanding of the good and what that directs us to do um, uh, compared to Adamantus's view. Uh, but in any case, uh, that's, that's sort of the metaphysical side of things, the, the understanding of reality towards which the philosopher is oriented. But now, let's look at the philosopher's soul. Let's look at who the philosopher is. <laughs> In book five, Socrates focuses on the notion of philosophia as love of wisdom. And that theme of the philosopher as a kind of lover is the central topic. Uh, there are lots of words for love, philia, eros, agape. Uh, those three words come up throughout this and are reflected on as they are in the Lysis. The same three words are studied. Uh, I'm not going to go through those words in detail, but the thing we're really going to focus on is the theme of Eros. Uh, so this begins using the word uh, philia. Socrates says to Glaucon, Will you need to be reminded, I said, or do you remember that when we say a man loves something, if it is rightly said of him, he mustn't show a love for one part of it and not for another, but must cherish all of it. The way he begins with this question of should you be reminded makes it sound a little bit like he's talking about something that was already discussed. Though he could just be saying, you know, do you remember this stuff we all know? It's not entirely clear, but you know, when you read this, you might think, hmm, I'm not sure that I remember hearing that exact topic before. And I don't think you did, but I think you heard something sort of close to it. And that was in the discussion of thirst back in book four, around 437 D and E. There he said, is thirst, thirst as such, employing those same notions of the qua or the insofar as, you know, thirst, properly speaking. He said, is thirst as such, thirst for, for a hot drink or a cold drink? He says, no, thirst is the thirst for, thirst as such is the thirst for drink as such. He says the same thing about knowledge and so on. Uh, there, uh, that doesn't sound exactly the same. That's saying, uh, if you love something or some kind of thing, you cherish all of it. But it's a similar point. Uh, it's a similar point that the very meaning of the thing, thirst or love or whatever, is an orientation to something as a whole. In the one case, with, when he's talking about thirst, it's a more abstract notion, like this is in principle for that kind of thing. Whereas here he's trying to bring out something a little bit more comprehensive. Uh, but I think you can see they're pretty similar points. Um, and, and I guess the, the reason I'm fussing over this a little bit is because the language is different. Right, he's going to go on to talk about eros. And back here, he was talking about epithumia. So the language of desire before isn't quite the same as the language of eros, which is more like passionate desire that we're going to talk about now. But I, I want you to notice one other passage, and that is at 475b. Uh, the, the lover, in terms of philia, is 
associated with the person who has eros, and at this point it's connected with the desire, and the word is epithumia. So my point is that through, through a series of, you know, slightly convoluted textual means, I think it's being made clear to us that this discussion here of eros is to be uh, overlain on and compared with that earlier discussion of thirst and epithumia. But in any case, let's see what he says about love. He says, aren't you supposed to cherish all of it? And then, then the word is going to turn into into Eros. You know, he asked Glaucon that question, and Glaucon says, well, I need reminding, as it seems, for I scarcely understand. And Socrates says, well, it was proper for another Glaucon to say what you're saying, but it's not proper for an erotic man to forget dot dot dot. Uh, I think the point he's making here is, somebody else could say they don't know what I'm talking about, but you can't, Glaucon, because you're an erotic man. Uh, I think the reason he says that, again, takes us back to an earlier discussion. Because in book three, they talked about Glaucon's uh, relation to Eros. Uh, this was book three, 402D to 403C. And we're going to come back and discuss that uh, in a minute. But in any case, let's see what he and Glaucon actually talk about. So he says, It's not proper for an erotic man to forget that all boys in the bloom of youth, in one way or another, put their stinger in an erotic lover of boys and arouse him. Uh, Glaucon had used that language of sting also when he talked about erotic necessities. He said they were more stinging. Uh, anyway, he says, uh, All seem worthy of attention and delight. Or don't you people behave that way with the fair, the beautiful? Uh, you praise the boy with the snub nose by calling him cute. The hook nose of another you say is kingly. And the boy between these two is well proportioned. The dark look manly. And the white are children of gods. And as for the honey-colored... Do you suppose their very name is the work of anyone other than a lover who renders sallowness endearing and easily puts up with it if it accompanies the bloom of youth? And in a word, you people take advantage of every excuse and employ any expression so as to reject none of those who glow with the bloom of youth. Um, the point he's making, first of all, is that the the truly erotic person, you know, when you're erotically aroused, right, that person sees all of the boys as desirable, right? So, uh, and this, his example of the honey-colored one is, is just an endearing, an endearing way to talk about sallowness, I think is particularly important, right, because he's saying there, when you have eros for this thing, something that somebody else might call ugly, you're able to see how it's beautiful. Uh, your eros is, in a way, the commitment to or the, the motivation for seeing everything as beautiful, seeing the beauty in things, turning the thing, so to speak, this way rather than that, bringing, bringing this side out of it rather than that. So, so that's the first thing about eros, right? That it's this passionate commitment for this whole field. Like he says, you know, somebody who has a real love of wine, just loves wine. Like this one's good for this reason, this one's good for this reason, but loves them all. Somebody who loves honor will take any kind of honor. He says, you know, somebody who's picky, like, oh, I only want this one, I only want that one. You say, you're not really a lover of honor. It's something, or, or lover of whatever the thing is we're talking about. It's really something else, you know. But he says, if you're really passionate, then that whole field is what uh, excites you and what, what you desire. Uh, and so he, he's going to say about the philosopher, he says it's, you're, you're going to be the lover of every kind of study, every kind of human learning. You're going to say, I want that because they all have the capacity to reveal to you, you know, the truth, the nature of things. And so that, that's, that comprehensiveness is what he's after, rooted in this kind of passionate embrace, connected with this idea that when you have that orientation, you you see, in this case, the thing people otherwise see as ugly, as beautiful. Uh, okay, with that in mind, now let's go back to what Glaucon says back in book three. Uh, Socrates and, and Glaucon had been talking about, you know, they'd been talking about musical education and the way it cultivates you to a point where you're attuned to issues of good form, you know, grace or, or gracelessness. Uh, and you respond to things that are, you know, properly well put together. And that's the foundation then for uh, 
moral virtue and the recognition of moral virtue and so on. And so it's in that context that they say at 402D, uh, Socrates says, well, if the fine dispositions that are in the soul and those that agree and accord with them in the form, I think he means in the bodily form there, uh, should ever coincide in anyone with both partaking of the same model, wouldn't that be the fairest sight for him who is able to see, right? Wouldn't the person who's really been attuned to the recognition of, of beauty uh, as the way things reflect what is good, essentially, wouldn't that person see a person who is like, a beautiful soul and a beautiful body, wouldn't they say that's the most perfect sight, right? And Glaucon says, by far. And Socrates says, and the mo the fairest, the most beautiful, is also the most loved, uh, the Erasmiotaton, right? It's a version of the word Eros. And uh, Glaucon says, of course. And so Socrates says, so the musical man would most of all love such human beings. Well, if there were one who lacked harmony, he wouldn't love him. And this is where Glaucon Glocon's position comes up. He says, well, no, he wouldn't. He said, at least if there were some defect in the soul, if, however, there were some bodily defect, he'd be patient and would willingly take delight in him. So Glocon there, well, then, and then Socrates says, oh, I understand. Uh, you have or had such a boy, and I concede your point. Um, but so, so the point there is Socrates says, oh, you're talking out of your own experience of being erotically wrapped up in someone. And the specific example is the same one that Socrates draws on later, right? Because uh, Glaucon says, well, oh, you know, you'd love a person who has a beautiful soul, even if their body isn't so beautiful. And so that's very much the same point that Socrates made in the section at the end of book five, that uh, you're able to find the person attractive that other people might find deficient. And so that's, uh, you know, presumably why Socrates said in book five, like, you're not entitled to say, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, but notice the way Glaucon talks to her. He says, uh, even if there was some bodily defect, he'd be patient and would willingly take delight in him. Uh, you know, maybe maybe that's fine. Maybe that sounds like the same kind of passion. But I wonder if, um, in that language already, Glaucon sounds a little bit tepid. Uh, um, but in any case, Socrates goes on and said, okay, I concede your point, but tell me this. Uh, does excessive pleasure have anything in common with moderation? And Glaucon says, how could it? since it puts men out of their minds, no less than pain. Um, so Glaucon here, and in the uh, ensuing exchange, uh, really denounces the excessive because of its association with, you know, mania, madness. The same thing comes up at 403a. Socrates says, can you tell of a greater or keener pleasure than the one connected with sex. And Glaucon says, no, I can't, nor a matter one either. Uh, and again, that should remind you way back in book one of uh, Sophocles talking about desires as many mad masters. Uh, so here, the, the thing is, we're seeing that, you know, erotic passion is associated with this thing that's like mania, it's madness. But Glaucon says, no, we don't, we don't want that, right? And so in relation to that, Socrates says, well, okay, so is the naturally right kind of love to love in a moderate and musical way that's orderly and fine? And Glaucon says, quite so. So then Socrates says, okay, so nothing that's mad or akin to licentiousness must approach the right kind of love. No, it mustn't. So the thing I want to say here about Glaucon is very similar to the sort of thing I said about Adamantus in book two. Uh, Glaucon seems to be asserting something here that Socrates is on record as saying the opposite of. Right? In the Phaedrus in particular, in the great speech that I actually mentioned in the last lecture, um, Socrates talks about erotic madness, and he talks about a range of different kinds of madness, and those are kind of the highest things. Those are uh, the most extreme and uh, fullest development of certain human capacities, and they're the most creative and in many ways the most powerful dimensions of our existence. So Socrates, in contrast to Glaucon, is very um, enthusiastic about madness. That's a bit of a pun because in madness can be called a kind of enthusiasm. Uh, uh, but Socrates is very enthusiastic about those things in a way that Glaucon is saying no to them. Glaucon is all about order and measure. And Socrates is very much oriented in the other direction. When they talk about truth, this issue, Glaucon's 
concern with the orderly and the measured is going to come up again. He says uh, 486D, um, do you believe that truth is related to want of measure or to measure? And Glaucon says to measure. Um, there's surely something right about that. And there's surely something right about his concern with order. But it seems to me Glaucon, compared to the things Socrates makes very clear elsewhere, it seems to me that Glaucon is quite one-sided. He's only seeing one thing. He's not seeing the importance and indeed kind of the primacy of the madness and the measureless. So all I want to bring out here is that Glaucon, it seems to me, is answering the wrong way. And so if we now compare that with the discussion that we just had uh, in Book 5 about Eros as the passion for the whole thing, it seems to me you already see it sounding a little bit different. You know, Glaucon has given his very orderly statement and Socrates is about, man, you're not, you're not a lover unless you're passionate about all the boys, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there are two points I want to bring out from this. The first one is just the idea that just as we've had to reconsider the calculating part in light of this discussion of noose that I, I was uh, involved in in the first part of this lecture, I think similarly, this discussion of Eros requires us to think a little bit more fully uh, about the desiring part, right? what was studied as epithumia in book four. Uh, and uh, in the case of epithumia in book four, what we really saw through the example of not drinking when you're thirsty because the calculating part says you shouldn't and so on, we were really oriented towards effectively the control of desire by calculation which seems very much linked to the way Glaucon is understanding moderation in those very sort of passages we were just reading. Um, when Socrates talks about the philosopher as having an eros for wisdom, for all kinds of learning, right? when he's seeing the motivation for that highest intellectual pursuit in eros, it seems like we're seeing quite a different view both of what desire is like and what its relationship to that higher part is. Uh, so, so that's the first point I want to make, that this discussion of Eros, it seems to me, uh, is calling us to reevaluate a little bit how we thought of that, so to speak, lowest part of the soul in our discussion of it in Book 4. And again, remember that in the Symposium or the Phaedrus, it's made very clear that Eros is the sort of deepest and most profound motivation in us and what propels us to the highest things. Um, in any case, that's the, that's the first point. Uh, the second point, though, I wanted to make was precisely about this issue of Glaucon's uh, giving the wrong answers. You know, I said before in book two that Adamantus gave the wrong answers to Socrates' question about the good. Here, in the discussion of moderation uh, and eros, it seems to me that uh, Glaucon gave the wrong answers to Socrates' question. Now, and, and I already connected that with the way he answers a question about knowledge, it seems to me the wrong way, or at least in a one-sided way in Book 6, when he only associates it with measure and not with the measureless. Well, I want to look at something else that Glaucon says in Book 6 that I think is wrong. <laughs> So in Book 6, uh, at 485a, uh, Socrates is talking with Glaucon about the philosopher now, and he says, About philosophic natures, let's agree that they are always in love with that learning which discloses to them something of the being that is always and does not wander about, driven by generation and decay. Well, that fits you know, exactly with what we've said. Uh, the philosopher is oriented towards understanding the nature of reality, uh, reality as such. So what what is reality as such, such that all of these things we see can transpire? Uh, and uh, that, uh, well, but he's in love with any learning that discloses that. So in love with, that's what we were just talking about. But, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to study your geography, I guess, and your history and your chemistry and all of those learnings, all of those areas of study that can disclose this to us. Uh, and so Glaucon says, yes, let's agree to that. And Socrates says, OK, and further, 
uh, that just like the lovers of honor and the erotic men we described before, they love all of it and don't willingly let any part of it go, whether smaller or bigger, more honorable or more contemptible. Uh, what you say is right, he said. Okay, basically the same point. So then Socrates says, okay, well, next, consider whether it is necessary, in addition, that those who are going to be such as we are saying have this further characteristic, no taste for falsehood. That is, they are completely unwilling to admit what's false, but hate it while cherishing the truth. Glaucon agrees, and, uh, uh, and then Socrates says, yes, in fact, whoever's erotically disposed to something is going to care for everything related and akin to it. Uh, Glaucon agrees, and Socrates says, could you find anything more akin to wisdom than truth? And Glaucon says, of course not. And then he says, is it possible that the same nature be a lover of wisdom and a lover of falsehood? In no way. Okay, uh, I think this is a kind of a, you know, another one where it's really a matter of seeing through the thing to what's going on. Uh, what are the truths and falsehoods we're going to talk about? Remember, we've said there are no goods that aren't also bad. There are no beauties that aren't also ugly. So it seems to me that you're going to study everything. But the issue is you're going to study everything for the sake of seeing in it what it discloses about reality. It seems to me Glaucon's answer is not that. It doesn't. I, th I think Glaucon is saying you only like truths, you don't like falsehoods. And I think that's basically the same thing that Adamantus was saying in book two when he said, there are no goods that do harm. Right? I think that Glaucon, like Adamantus, is holding apart as two separate actualities what are really the inescapable two sides of any reality. And so uh, that really comes out, I think, a little bit more clearly uh, in, again, an exchange with Adamantus, because, again, shortly after this, Adamantus interrupts, and then Socrates talks with him. Uh, and in the conversation with Adamantus at 490c, Socrates said, okay, if, if truth led the way, we wouldn't, I suppose, ever assert a chorus of evils could follow it. Uh, Adamantus says, of course not. But I think that's the same point, right? I think that, uh, uh, yeah, if truth led the way, if, if a chorus of goods followed it, well, then that also means a chorus of evils is following it. A chorus of truths could follow truth, but that would also be a chorus of falsehoods. Right? I think that the thing Socrates has been emphasizing at the end of book five, when he said, you know, every beautiful thing is also ugly. And as he's about to say in a couple of more pages, when he says the very things that make a person good could also make that person bad. I think the thing he's really trying to emphasize is the need to be attuned to the ambivalent character of things. Um, but I think these two, Adamantus and Glaucon, uh, both have a much more rigid kind of distinction going on. Um, but so then let's think about what Socrates' point really means about the philosopher. I mean, I think, yeah, truth is going to be followed by a chorus of falsehoods and evils. The job of the philosopher isn't to get away from the false thing and the evil thing. It's really going to be to relate to those things that are ambivalent. Uh, to see through them, kathorao, to the truth, right? So, you know, the issue is, how are you going to recognize those powers, right? And he has a discussion of the recognition of powers at the end of book five at uh, 477d, right? And the, the point is, yeah, you can only see powers through their effects, which is what we've already been talking about. That's the kathorao. And it seems to me that what the philosopher's job is is to recognize that in anything he's seeing powers enacted and the job of the philosopher because the philosopher is characterized by eros but eros for truth is to be able to see the truth in anything to see how the truth is appearing in anything in the same way that the person with the eros for boys can see the beauty in any boy, right? And I, you know, boy meaning young man, not meaning child. 
And then I want to add one further thing about that. Remember, I already read you that passage from the beginning of book six that said, you know, the philosopher, in the sense we're talking about it, has to be a person of virtue and basically full human accomplishment and so on. So I think that also means then that, you know, being in love with the sight of truth or being in love with the sight of the good isn't just a detached cognitive matter. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a matter of behaving. So recognizing the truth in anything is sort of a matter of behaving truthfully in relationship to anything. Recognizing the good in anything is a, is a matter of behaving well in relationship to that. And so I think then that the, the point is the philosopher is the one then for whom the recognition of these highest truths about reality takes the form of a kind of behavioral commitment to bringing out the truth and goodness in any situation right so if you know if you if you want to call uh, that apprehension of the highest truths contemplation which is the way we often see um, theoria translated and, or that you know that's a word often used to, in, in English translations to name that grasp of those highest principles you can see that contemplation is actually, uh, as understood here, more like a kind of witnessing in, in sort of the religious sense, Christian sense, right? That apprehending those things is a way of apprehending these things. And it's a way of apprehending these things that is effectively turning them to the true and the good and the beautiful. <laughs> So I want to end just with one last uh, little topic from this section, it's pretty central in this section, uh, about who the philosopher is. And the question here is how you're going to recognize the philosopher. Right? We've been talking about what the philosopher has to do or what one has to do to recognize the good and so on. But how do you recognize the philosopher? And, you know, Socrates began with the third wave by saying, well, the thing that people are going to find hard to believe is that philosophers have to be kings. That's the sort of shorthand for saying philosophy and political rule have to coincide. Uh, and he said, you know, the reason people are going to balk at that is because they think they know what philosophers are, right? They're those, whatever they are, like university professors, those ivory tower intellectuals who uh, are useless. You know, they just to have their little airy thoughts that have no connection with the real world or else they're those kind of vicious people who know how to use argumentation to make things that are really false and bad seem to be true right that's what philosophers that's what people think philosophers are those are philosophers nowadays and Socrates says well that don't don't confuse that with what it is to be a philosopher. So sticking with those for a minute, I want to just br bring out a little bit of what the, those people negatively portrayed there. You know, he says people are often concerned that those bad people, sophists, are getting people, convincing them of bad things. You know, they, they lecture to them about bad ideas and turn people onto bad ideas. And he has a pretty interesting discussion. This is uh, around uh, 492b to 493c. He says, yeah, you know, there are such people in a way. Like, we're, I know what you're talking about. But you're misunderstanding what they are. Uh, the real sophist is something more like public opinion. He says people get together in the assembly and they talk about stuff. And... You kind of get a the the attitude of a group, which is nobody's attitude in particular, but there's a certain thing that you might kind of call public opinion, and it's not very insightful. Uh, and he says those people that you think are going around corrupting the youth by, you know, teaching them false things, what they're really doing is just affirming the views of public opinion. The the bad thing they do is just convince people that they should accept what that great sophist public opinion says. Uh, and so you're wrong to think that there are individuals going out there corrupting people. The thing you have to be more concerned about is 
this uh, persuasive power of public prejudice. Maybe quite closely related then to the way the apology begins with Socrates talking about the way he has been condemned in public opinion that has no one as its author, kind of anonymous public opinion. So that's what he says about, you know, sophistry and so on, uh, which I think is pretty important. Um, and the, the thing that I especially want you to notice about that is, what what is the skill then that these sophists have, right? It's not that they're going out and, and convincing you of bad things. That's public opinion. Their skill, he says, is really, you know, just sort of knowing how to uh, manipulate, as he says, this sort of beast of public opinion to, uh, you know, sway people. It's, it's not about having particular ideas. It's a sort of a skill in manipulating the terms of public discourse or something like that. So, so let me just read you the line. He says at 493a, he says, each of these private wage earners, whom these men call sophists, uh, educates in nothing other than the, the convictions of the many. Uh, it's just like the case of a man who learns by heart the angers and desires of a great strong beast he is rearing, you know, how it should be approached and how taken hold of, uh, uh, and that person learns how to control things. He says that's what those people are doing. So I want you to notice what that skill is that these people have. It's not wisdom or insight. It's it's something else. It might, it might be, you know, a knack, whatever. Uh, but that's then contrasted with the real philosopher. The real philosopher that we've seen is the person who is, on the contrary, very much oriented to uh, thinking for her or himself. That, that is to say, someone who is using his or her own powers of noose, or the powers made available to us by our noose, uh, to apprehend the nature of things through the things here, such that um, uh, he or she is able to behave in such a way as to bring out the good from them. Right. So it's interesting then that this the the philosopher is in a sense looking there to be able to navigate this well, right? and that's the image that he uses at um, 488a to 489a when he talks about a pilot on a ship. He says. You know, the pilot on a ship looks up at the stars to navigate. And the other sailors, they don't know anything about that. And they say, why is this guy looking up there? Uh, he doesn't know what he's doing, and they mutiny him, and, you know, they can't sail and so on. Um, the thing I want you to think about there, of course, is both uh, that structure of sort of uh, the equating of looking there and acting here, uh, but, uh, but also I, I want you to think about that issue of recognizing the philosopher, right? The people in the in the ship, the sailors on the ship, uh, don't recognize the pilot for a pilot, partially because they themselves um, don't have that perspective. They are not in the same way oriented towards the true and the good. And because they don't have those kind of patterns in themselves, to use the language of book three, they don't really recognize them when they see them. Uh, so I especially want you to go back and look in book three at the uh, image of the judge. Uh, this is from 409 C to E, because there Socrates was really talking about like how you have to be educated and how your soul has to be organized such that you can recognize a good person when you when you see one. And I'd like you to think about that in relationship to the experience of the one who manipulates the great beast of public opinion and the the stargazing pilot of the ship. Uh, in any case, that's that's the basic portrait of the philosopher that's come out of the end of book five and the first two thirds of book six. And I've especially tried to bring out now what that's showing us about the division of the soul that was introduced to us in book four, and especially now about reconsidering or, or deepening our understanding of what that highest part of the soul is, the thing that makes it possible for us to calculate but also what the desiring part is and what the relationship is between them. Uh, so we'll move on now to the end of book six and book seven, where he talks more about the uh, experience and the education of the philosopher. <laughs>